Um, Gopi, we, we started this session 15 minutes late. So may I have your permission to go on till 4 p.m.? Because the next session is supposed to start at 4 p.m., is that okay? So we have 15 minutes for Q&A session. So 10 minutes, 10 minutes sorry, 10 minutes. <laughs> 10 minutes for Q&A. So can I take three questions at a time? Uh, those who wish to put questions, can you raise your hand? Cambridge. Yeah. You're going to have to tell me the question because okay. I've only got one ear. So okay, I can't quite hear also. The acoustics are not so good. Such a good presentation. Hi. Where, where are you? Here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> where? Oh, okay. okay. Can you uh, tell us who you are? Yeah, um, Kunur Kripalani. Uh, can you stand up, please, so we can see you? <laughs> Kunur Kripalani from the uh, Center of Asian Studies at Hong Kong U. Um, we were talking about, um, sorry, it's very loud, uh, about contributions of the diaspora, and I wanted to um, put a question to Mr. Amitaj about uh, the Afghani diaspora who has attempted to contribute to the political life and make that difference in Afghanistan. But it seems as if that uh, diaspora may not actually be relating to the situation on the ground. And uh, where all morning long we've spoken of uh, a lot of giving back from the diaspora, um, how do you see this in Afghanistan? Is it actually working in the reverse? Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Kono. I didn't, didn't recognize you. She's a member of the board of the Asian Civilizations Museum. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you, you, you want to go first? Ooh, she asked me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Make, keep it short, though. <laughs> I, um, originally, after the uh, invasion of Afghanistan by the coalition forces in uh, late 2001, we saw a large number of Afghan diaspora, particularly uh, people who uh, had... Uh, been prominent uh, prior to say, 1976 or so, which I thought was the sort of the spring uh, in Afghanistan and education flourished, etc. Many of them were excited about coming back and participating, and they did. Uh, but from my point of view, they became rapidly disillusioned. Uh, corruption overtook all, and many of those people have returned either to the states or from whence they came. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my overall view is the diaspora who did return became cynical, became weary, uh, and uh, in many cases gave up hope of really being assistance to Afghanistan. And I'm sorry about that. Thank you, Rich. Thank you. Another question, please. Uh, maybe we'll have a man next and then another woman. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Can I give him? Yeah, please. T. N. Srinivasan. I was one of the speakers yeah, this morning. Professor T. N. Srinivasan, from Ye formerly of Yale, now with the LKY School. Uh, I have uh, two questions. One to uh, Professor uh, Mr. Armitage, and the other to Matihara. Now, Mr. Armitage's presentation, impressive presentation as it was, is to, did not mention what role he thinks China hmm. can play or for towards greater reconciliation in South Asia or hmm. in the opposite direction. Uh, India's security concerns <clears throat> now, significant part of it mm -hmm. is Ch China, in a view that China encircles India uh, in many ways with its neighbors. So I wanted to have his uh, view. And uh, Professor Matiharas, I found two issues that you didn't mention, which uh, from the South Asia perspective is very important. One is migration. Is Japan going to change in any way uh, the, its uh, attitude towards migration of, for example, South Asian and others? Second. You, in discussing the nuclear, the, the earthquake and the nuclear thing, you again didn't mention the 
what has since been revealed, this collaboration between the regulators and the regulatees, namely the power companies in India, both are in the, in the hands of government, power producers and the mm -hmm. power regulators with respect to nuclear energy. This is a combination which can lead to the worst consequences mm -hmm. of what happened in Fukushima. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Rich, first. Uh, sir, uh, I look at it a little differently. I think that uh, China should look at uh, the strategic relationship that India and uh, the United States have first. Our relationship is not one to contain China, let me be very clear, but it is one based on the view that China has the best chance of a peaceful re-rise on the world stage if that re-rise is rooted in an area of strong democracies. And in that regard, India, United States, Japan, the Republic of Korea, Indonesia, first of all. Second, the role in South Asia I have found uh, neutral to unhelpful. For instance, in Afghanistan, uh, China is pursuing a, what I would consider a mercantilist policy. Uh, they invest, they buy mines, they don't hire Afghan citizens to work, they don't buy Afghan equipment, they bring it all in from China. So that, that's not quite, I think, the way the game is supposed to be played. In Pakistan, recently, I found China uh, to be pulling back a little bit, and I think, though I can't be sure, this is related to the fear of extremism and the fear of dislocations in Xinjiang, which they've suffered mm -hmm. in, in past years. So, okay. Any, any comment on the so-called Chinese string of pearls around India? Yes, if I were India, I would be quite nervous about a string of pearls, and if I saw a uh, naval base, for instance, in the Andaman Sea, or if I saw China developing a naval base in Pakistan, I think I would be assured of the fact that that's what they're doing, a string of pearls. This is, uh, I think, one of the reasons that uh, might have propelled uh, India to be more um, anxious, alert to uh, pursue this strategic relationship with the United States. It's something that I look at every day. But isn't it um, true, sorry to disagree with you, isn't it true that um, there's too much hype in this string of pearl theory, that many of the ports that China is developing in the region are being done for commercial reason, and, and the host country had offered India the first option and only turned to China after India turned them down, Sri Lanka being an example. Well, I would say you need to have a Chinese citizen answer that question because only they would know what's in their mind, but I think the base at Trimkomali in Sri Lanka, which you're referring to, uh, President Rajapaksa has told me on several occasions that no, no, just a commercial port, and that's fine, it's every right to do that. Uh, but if China is not explaining in a transparent way her actions, then I don't believe there's too much hype. If I were a citizen of India and had responsibilities in the government until it was clarified in my mind what China was up to, then I would uh, be nervous. Okay. I was only reflecting the view of my guru, Gopina Pili. Um, ben, two questions for you. Two questions. Uh, the answer to the first question is, uh, as background, Japan is aging population, declining population. So the first thing we have to do is to activate more unused women power within Japan. But then we have to do, together with that, uh, encourage immigration uh, on, a, let's say, a selective basis. This has to be thought out by the government. The second question I gather is uh, about our nuclear problem okay. in which the regulators and the operators, the, their roles and responsibilities have not been defined in the past. And this definitely has to be defined. And this lack of definition has in fact worsened what happened at Fukushima this year, this time. Thank you. Um, yes, please. Um, <laughs> hello, um, I'm Shu Jin from uh, the National University of Singapore. Um, a South Korean academic uh, working on South Korean investment in India. Uh, I have a question to um, Mr. Makihara, who could give us an insight as foreign investor uh, based on Indian experience of Mitsubishi in the manufacturing sector in India. 
Today, um, among foreign investors, nobody maybe doubts the potentials of entering the Indian market, especially for South Korean investors, Japanese investors, plus Chinese investors recently who have competed in the getting pre-occupancy uh, in the manufacturing sector in India. However, in South Korean or Japanese perspectives, there are substantial um, social, cultural, and political constraints, as many as uh, potentials in setting up business in India, in Indian market, as well as uh, the other countries in South Asia. Okay. Can you ask your question? Yeah. For yeah. Japanese investors, what is the most difficult part in the progress of uh, investment in, in South Asian countries? And what are their exertions to overcome those hindrances? I'm afraid this will have to be the last question. So I think in one word, the greatest impediment towards smooth investment uh, is uncertainty, which is corruption, which is graft, mm. and uh, interpretation of regulations which change from time to time. Thank you, Ben. Um, I'm afraid the timekeeper has signaled me to stop, so I'm, I'm sorry we're not challenging you more, Rich. <laughs> but um, please join me in thanking Rich, Ben, and uh, Ashok. To the panel, thank you so much. May you please invite you to remain on stage as we invite Ambassador Gopinath Pile uh, to please join us and present tokens of appreciation to our esteemed panel. I think uh, we had a very, very good discussion. I just wish it could have been longer, uh, in my personal opinion. Um, Mr. Richard Amaterish, I'm sure will be uh, an opportunity for us to meet again in Singapore very, very soon. Ambassador Pile, please, let you firstly present Tokens of appreciation to our distinguished speaker. Firstly, to Mr. Rittich, Richard Armitage, please. That was good. That was very good. To Ms. Minoru Makihara from Japan. And last but certainly not the least, Professor Tan Chung or Professor Ashok. <laughs> not forgetting.